What you're seeing are biblically descriptions of angels. And there is no mistake that they're huge in representation to the size of an average man. Now, until I saw this video, I didn't really give a lot of thought or consideration to what angels look like. I never really put a lot of time into it, but before I saw this video, I was under the impression that angels look like humans. And why is that? And this is one of the things that we're going to talk about in this video, why false narratives are all over the place and how you can counteract that because why the truth is ignored. So we'll take me like I really didn't understand or acknowledge what an angel looked like because I wasn't looking for angels. And the, one of the things that is interesting is the appearance of angels is clearly spelled out in the text of the Bible. But number one, I don't read the Bible. I am not a student of the Bible. I don't look at the Bible. I don't read the Bible. I, don't, I really don't pay a lot of attention to the Bible. So from that, and it was really interesting because uh, one of the things that I did is I went to YouTube and I went to Google who makes more money, investors or business owners. That question didn't even rank in YouTube or Google. So there is a number of people who are not looking for that information because it's not even a search term. It's not even, it doesn't even populate. And it got me to thinking most of us, just like my um, situation with the angels, since I wasn't looking for angels, I didn't have an understanding of what angels look like. Okay. And since most people are not looking for that information of does a business owner or investor makes the most money, most people don't have an understanding because they're not looking for it. They're not searching for it. And I kind of had a, as Oprah would call it, an aha moment. Why? False narratives are believed to be the truth because the average person is not looking for the truth. Like I said, it was an aha moment for me because it was just like, oh, because at one point I was really, really frustrated with the things that were going on in YouTube and the internet. And then now that I have a greater understanding, that most people are not even looking for this information. They're not searching for this information. And this is what I like to call the internet charlatans who know better can take advantage of people because they know that people are not studying. They know that people are not looking. They know that people have no basic understanding of the subject matter. And, I, and, you know, like I said, it, it was like a big aha moment. It's like, oh, that's why. Because one of the things, and this kind of goes back to my video, The American Dream in a Broken Village. Um, let's go back to one of the people that I mentioned in the video, Olivia. Olivia was smart. She was really, really smart. But because of her extremely dysfunctional background, Olivia never had a chance. And as I go across these statistics and I come to a greater level of understanding, it can be heartbreaking that right now I can go to College Park and I can literally pick a kid off of the street and predict their future with a great deal of accuracy because of the zip code that they were born in. That is heartbreaking. That is heartbreaking because 
you know, with my video, that upward mobility isn't as easy as I thought because I was using selection bias. I was using myself and not to be overly uh, self-indulgent here. I am fairly special and I don't mean that to be arrogant or condescending, but for me to transverse the path of my origination point in life and to where I'm currently at, that is not an easy or normal act. But since I was occupying the vessel, I was inside the vessel. So I wasn't on the outside looking in because I, I had a friend who came to me and I've known this person, God, uh, since elementary school. And uh, he has since passed. He had a heart attack and he died. But we were Facebook friends and he saw all the stuff I was doing. And you never know who's going to support you. And he, he sent me this very long message was like, dude, you know where we come from? The things you're doing are amazing. I am so proud of you. It just literally blew me away. He understood because he knew my origination point. And many of you here on YouTube, you don't know my origination point. Uh, parts of me feel that I might go back to where I was born and do drone shots to show you the environment that I grew up in was nothing like the environment that I currently dwell in. It was, it was nothing even close. And I'm becoming to a lot of truths because that angel video, there's a video here on YouTube. It's got like 5 million views. It was just like, it prompted me to do this video because you're not stupid. You're not dumb. You're not mentally retarded. The problem is there is a lack of intellectual curiosity. And the average person during this global reset, if you're an average person, if you're one of those people who make $35,000 a year or less, you are not wondering what angels look like. You're not wondering what do business owners or investors make the most money. That is so far from your daily reality, it ain't funny. You're wondering, how do I buy food? How do I put gas in my car? How do I pay the rent? How do I pay the mortgage? That is occupying 90% of your mental bandwidth. You don't have time or the luxury to ponder. And this is why I, I, I put my head up there wondering, but not lost. I want to say something that may sound a little off base, but it is a luxury in these United States of America to sit back, relax, and wonder about the possibilities. I have a greater appreciation of where I'm at in life. You know, I was always thankful and appreciative, but after understanding, you know, that I don't have, I don't have to wake up any particular time unless I designate like, um, Early in my YouTube career, I used to get up at 4.30 in the morning because I was extremely productive. Now that I'm in semi-retirement, um, I roll out of bed whenever. I don't have to get up. Like if my girl stays over and, you know, I'll, you know, I'll probably, but there are times that I have literally, and I'm very, very thankful for this. There are times that I have literally laid in bed till 12 o'clock. <laughs> just not sleep, just chilling, just chilling because I didn't have to be anywhere. I didn't have to do anything. I just, my whole day was open 
for me to discover the possibilities. And for this life, I'm extremely thankful and grateful because this is not a life that the average person can even imagine. Right now, there's someone who's going to get up tomorrow at oh dark 30, maybe five o'clock, maybe six o'clock to prepare themselves to go to work and they're going to work eight, 10, 12 hours. And then they're going to come home. They're going to eat some food, maybe watch a little TV, maybe hang out with their wife and kids, go to bed and then wake up and do it all over again tomorrow. And this is why weekends, cause I had a video up there that was extremely dismissive of the weekend because for me, Monday through Sunday can be like a weekend day. I have the ability to literally say, I ain't gonna do nothing today, I'm gonna just chill. I can do that whenever I want to. And often I take advantage of that. And like, to be honest with you guys, I have got to get back in the habit of working. Uh, one of the things I do like, and let me tell you, cause I know myself, I know myself, I understand myself. A few weeks ago, I started having what I like to call internet or YouTube days where I would sit and shoot videos back to back to back. And today is a YouTube day. And once again, since I know myself and I know how I operate, I knew that I had to establish a new habit. And now the habit is established where I can shoot videos for all of the channels in one day, because here's the thing. If I was to get up and shoot every day, that would be a grind. But since tomorrow is a car day, I, I got to meet five people to sell cars. I won't be doing any videos or internet stuff tomorrow. So I will probably lay in bed until 10 and my first appointment is at 12 and my second one's at 1230 and so on and so forth. So I now have a greater understanding of what you guys are going through because it's not on your radar because you have more pressing issues to deal with. And I have a greater understanding and appreciation of that because I used to just sit here and just be dumbfounded. Just like, why don't they know? Why are they believing in these false narratives? Now we're going to talk about that in a minute. One of the things that I've come to understand is each one of us is indoctrinated to a degree. So our schools prep us to ask for permission for virtually everything. It's like, can I do this? Can I do this? Can I do this? So the institution of school institutionalizes you to ask for permission for everything which makes free thinking not such a popular pastime. I grew up and went through an education system where teachers pushed you to think. They pushed you to be different. They, they pushed you to be creative. I don't think that's the case today. And with the indoctrination of people The way that society is set up is you can be fed these false narratives and because you're institutionalized not to question, not to wonder, not to speak back, you just take it because you're institutionalized or a better word would be you're programmed. You're programmed to take the false narrative. You're programmed, you're institutionalized. And once again, because intellectual curiosity, a fancy little term is not the norm. It's not the norm. So you have been prepped and programmed and institutionalized so you can easily be lied to. 
Do you know that Columbus, yes, Christopher Columbus, who sailed the ocean blue 1972, was a sex trader. Yes, yeah, that Christopher Columbus, he, it's, Google it. Christopher Columbus, sex trader. He was a sex trader. He was a deviant. But we take it as Christopher Columbus discovered America and he should be held and canalized. He should be held and canalized in the historical archives as a hero. When this man <clears throat> was not that far removed from a common criminal. Different times, different places, different moralities, because he was picking up children. Yes, children from these um, different continents and selling them into sexual slavery. Yes, that Christopher Columbus. And I say that because for many of you, this will be the first time that you've ever heard this. I'm about to actually tell you something else. We all know that the slave master slept with the female slaves. We have historical and biological proof of that because of the number of fair complected to light skinned black people with blue and green eyes. This is a DNA proof that this happened. But what you don't know is the slave master wasn't the only one sleeping with the slaves. Miss Ann and Miss Becky was getting her groove on as well. See, <clears throat> one of the things you got, yeah, you've, you've never heard that before and you will not see it pushed or because the false narrative, well, the fact that the slave master slept with the female slaves is not a false narrative. But the absence of the corresponding narrative is intriguing. Because if you knew that Miss Ann, Miss Becky was tipping down to the slave quarters to get herself a big black buck to get that big African dick, it would change your opinion of Miss Ann. See, there was this whole notion of white female purity which is why black men were hung and lynched for merely even looking at them because here's the thing. People of all times knew that young people had sexual curiosity and they knew, and this is why they worked so hard to keep those white women from the black men because let's fast forward to the day. If you want to, you can go to Pornhub or YouPorn and looked up blacked, B-L-A-C-K-E-D, blacked. And it is a section that deals with black men with extremely large penises tearing little white girls, not just white girls, but slim to small to attractive, the type of white women that white men like, fucking them into oblivion. Every hole is on the table. Mouth, pussy, ass, every hole. <clears throat> and this is, this would have happened if there wasn't so much cultural interference that Miss Becky and Mandingo found each other. Because they weren't supposed to be together. They weren't supposed to be copulating. They weren't supposed to be having that African jungle love. But they do. And I'm about to peep some to you. If you go to the internet and put in vintage interracial porn, you will see that going down from the 1920s and they got real big and stuff in the 60s and 70s. It became a thing in the 60s and 70s. So from that standpoint, people are living in the matrix. 
that movie rings more and more true to me every day because <clears throat> people are living in the matrix of false information and because they've been programmed or institutionalized just to take it at face value, it's like, oh, okay. And not to question it, not to wonder, not to ponder, not to have intellectual curiosity. They're living in the matrix and they're being told that data bites are steak and they're eating it and they're cutting it up and it feels like steak, it looks like steak, it tastes like steak, but as the little kid in the matrix says, there is no spoon. That's the trick. There is no spoon. And what does this have to do with the global reset? After the global reset, and the global reset is not the end of the world. Far, far from it. The global reset is a shifting of the chess pieces on the global chessboard. It's not end of the world. The world is not going to end no time soon. It's not happening. What is going to happen, and if you understand wealth from a global standpoint, if you're in the United States of America and you make $35,000 a year, you are in the top 1% of the world's richest people from a global standpoint. When you compare that $35,000 a year, you have cable, you have a cell phone, you have a car or two, you eat out, you have many creature comforts that literally 80% of the world doesn't have. 80% of the world doesn't have this. When you factor in all of the Indians, like the billions of Indians in India, when you factor in the billions of Chinese in China, when you factor in all of the people living in South America in the jungles, when you factor all of them, your $35,000 per year makes you actually quite wealthy from a worldview standpoint. From a standpoint of in the United States, when you're comparing that $35,000 to someone who makes a million a year, you're broke. But from a world standpoint, you're like in the top 90% of the world's richest people with your 35,000. And that is important because we cannot have two Americas. And this is a really interesting thing. Do you know for the longest period of time, the world's second largest economy was Japan until they went through their lost decade. So we have the United States, we have the second largest economy in China. Then I think the third largest economy is either Japan or Britain, but we cannot have another United States of America in the, caros the carousel of economies. And we, cause here's the thing, we are a nation of consumers. We cannot have, and I'm about to admit some stuff that may not be too cool for a lot of you because I know there are children starving in Africa. I'm at a point where if I, and this is something I do all the time and I've never talked about it. If I want a, ta a taste of something, just a taste, and I, I order it, I will order stuff and I know before I order it that I'm not going to eat all of it. I'm just going to like, take a few bites and then it's going to go in the refrigerator um, or it's going to go in the trash. And what's been happening is my girlfriend has been going through the leftovers. So it's not going to waste. But before she came on the scene, um, I just throw it away. I didn't really care. It was just like, I just wanted a taste. There is a place that I order pizzas from that are so delicious and one of the things is I'm really mindful of my weight. I get on the scale every morning and when my weight starts creeping up like one or two pounds, 
it's at ease. I start uh, internet, intermittent fasting. I stopped eating because I was having this conversation with an Uber driver years ago. How many 300 pound old people do you see? You see none. You see not a one. And my goal is to live as long as possible. So I know that getting fatter is not in my best interest. So this is one of the reasons I eat the way that I do. Cause my girlfriend, she's like, you really don't eat that much. It's like, not really. Because I know that if I was eating the traditional three meals a day, I'd be 300 pounds. I would be 300 pounds. So one of the things I'm beginning to understand because it was perplexing because when, and you know, just fun fact about me, I would put the weirdest search terms in Google and frequently I would put search terms in Google that are not already there. I will put search terms in YouTube that are not already there. Like I'll put it in there because when it's already there, it populates and it's like, oh, this is here. Other people are looking for it. Every day I put in search terms that don't populate, that do not um, register because I am the only one looking for this stuff. I am the only, and that, that was part of the aha moment when I looked in there and saw that no one else was looking to see if business owners or investors made the most money, which requires a broader understanding that I had not figured into my calculations. Number one, all the time, I am literally, I would spend two to three hours a day just researching, looking up stuff, looking up stats and doing and crunching numbers and looking at charts and stuff. Average person doesn't do that. The average person doesn't have the mental bandwidth, nor the time, nor the purpose. See, I have a purpose for all this. I have multiple YouTube channels. I run businesses. I teach. I have purposes for getting all of this data. Whereas the average person, man, <clears throat> I'm just trying to put gas in my Ford F-150. I don't have time for all that. And I get it now. Until I had that aha moment, I didn't get it. I didn't understand because I was looking from inside the vessel. I'm in the vessel. I'm in the vessel. I'm driving the car. I'm not outside. I am not outside looking in. And this is why I have uh, some friends who kind of tell me about myself on occasion because they're on the outside and they have that outside perspective that I cannot see because I'm in the car driving the car. I cannot see nor understand because I'm a different kind of motherfucker. I am wired a little differently. One of the things I like to do is just look up stuff to look it up because it's fun. And it kind of reminds me of Sharp. Now, who is Sharp? Sharp is a pimp that was interviewed on Soft White Underbelly and he was interviewed on No Jumper. Sharp is an extremely charismatic individual. And if you have a little time, put in Sharp Car in the YouTube algorithm, in the YouTube search bar, and you will see Sharp in the video long before he got on soft white underwear because he had uh, pimped out a, a Chevelle. And he had his press, he's a very engaging, charismatic person, but he's also a realist. And that's one of the things I like about Sharp because he'll go by Sharp or Sharpie. And I was remember when he was talking about the ism, you know, a girl turned me on to the ism. And in that moment, I encapsulated that many of you have not been turned on. You have not been turned on. You've not been turned on to the ism. 
You've not been indoctrinated. You have not been exposed. Because in that moment, I encapsulate and I was like, oh, this is what's going on. Because, you know, sometimes I get up here and I, I am a salty, salty dude sometimes. I'm a really, really salty. I apologize for that because sometimes I'm just like, why don't they get it? Why don't they get it? And I had to realize the problem wasn't you. You're not the problem. The problem was me and my limited perspective. And once I expanded my perspective, stuff started falling into place like boom, 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 like a pile of bricks that stacked themselves up in the corner. Because you're not looking to see if business owners make more money than investors because you're fighting so many demons and issues every day that that doesn't even enter your mental worldview. That doesn't even pop up. It isn't even on the roadmap. It is not even... This is why I feel that entertainment is so powerful. Jamie Foxx is an amazing storyteller. He has all of the facial expressions to gather the tonality. He has the full repertoire to tell a story, a deeply engaging story to have everyone sitting on the edge of their seat. And one of the things that I have learned from Jamie Foxx is I'm a pretty good storyteller to begin with. However, to take my storytelling to the next level, I have to adopt some of the stuff from Jamie Foxx. I have to become more engaging. I have to become more charismatic because it is my goal to indoctrinate you. It is my goal to reprogram you because here's the thing. You were just born into this. You didn't ask for none of this. You were just born into this and based upon where your parents chose to settle down and bring you up is what happened. And all of this was out of your control. You had no say so in this whole thing. You had no prerogative. You had nothing. You were just there. And then the programming and the institutionalizing, it dropped in. And the next thing you know, you were 35, married to Sheila with two kids. And you were like, how the hell did my life end up like this? How did this happen? And you're sitting there one night and you just got finished fucking Sheila and you had a good nut and you're looking at her and you get up and you sit on the edge of the bed and you just ponder, how did this happen? Because once again, you were institutionalized and you was programmed. And right now, during this global reset, many people are rejecting their programming. This is why you're starting to see all of these videos talking about how I am opting out of the American dream. These people are conscientiously rejecting their programming. But here's the danger. Here's the danger with that. You eject your instilled programming, right? But what are you going to replace it with? In that space, it will be a problem. Because when I reprogram myself, I understand what I went through. I replaced the cultural institutional programming with my own personal programming. That's why I can come here on the YouTubes and talk about I'm a dom and BDS. I, I don't give a damn. I don't have to say things to come across as a likable guy. MTR, Mediocre Tutorial Reviews, was recently canceled. And MTR 
on the bandwidth, let's say I'm a 40, MTR is like a two. He is benign. He doesn't do rants. He doesn't go after people. I don't even think he cusses, but he got canceled. But I, because of my programming, I was able to take an internet deluge and come out clean. The internet tried to cancel me. I had people coming on my Facebook page. They couldn't do it. And they were like, once again, because people are not tough. Uh, people don't have the hardiness to stay with some that once they figured out that that's a really tough bird to kill, they stopped trying and they went away. But MTR got canceled and I didn't because of my programming, because I learned to program myself. And what I have to learn is how to program you. Once again, I am still learning each and every day. I don't know everything, but I know a lot, but I'm learning each and every day. And I need to start the movement because that whole, you know, that whole thing with the angels, it, it, it deeply impacted me because I figured myself to be I'm a pretty smart guy. I had no clue to what biblical angels look like because I don't read the Bible. And this led me down this path of, oh shit, this is why they don't know. Damn, holy fuck. This is why they don't know because it's not on the radar. And it's not on the radar because they have all of these things going on in their life. Holy shit. Holy fuck. I understand now. I get it because it's amazing how when you leave yourself open to being educated, because when you learn, because here's something you didn't know. If you go to the dictionary and learn one new word for every one word you learn, you will learn five to 10 additional words because it creates a chain of learning. And this is one of the things that I'm going to do in the new training because I'm excited at the future and the possibilities of the future. I'm excited. I'm excited because this is why all of these YouTubers who put out intentionally blatant and misleading information because you have been programmed to eat it up. You have been institutionalized. You have been programmed. Kind of like the Tindler, the tin, the Tindler Swind, Tinder Swindler. I did a video talking about that dude. I understand exactly what he did. I understand why it worked. I understand how he programmed these women. And it was interesting to watch that two of the women, the third woman, she's done with him. But the other two, if he came back and said, baby, let's get back together. They would hop back on that penis in a heartbeat because they're still in love with this dude because he pressed their emotional buttons the correct way. It's like a code. Doo -doo 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 -doo. And he got them locked down, even though he took all his money from them. This is a samurai sword. It's actually kind of sharp. I actually could. Um, do some damage with this if I wanted to, even though it's a replica. But let's talk about the Tindler, Tinder Swindler. Go ahead, check it out. The Tinder Swindler is on Netflix. And you will see, and see if you agree with me, that the first two women that they portray on there are still in love with this guy. I'm about to share something with you guys that um, I'm going to do in Glendon's Voodoo. There is a methodology, there is a way to actively program a person. And this is one of the reasons I've been really successful because once you learn the steps and 
dominance is a very important tool in coming to program women. Because if you're watching what I've been putting up on Disruptive Male, like the video of the day where I had three women who were in love with me, that wasn't an accident. I didn't understand what I was doing when I was doing it because I, let me go ahead and tell you the story. Years ago, I got the storage unit of an old school DOM. When I say DOM, that's D-O-M, which is short for dominant male. And this dude, I made so much money off this unit. He had Polaroids, he had manuals, he had instructions, and I inhaled all that, sold all those pictures. We were selling pictures because they were Polaroid pictures, 100, 200, 300 bucks, because you couldn't just find this stuff anywhere. He kept copious records. And as I was going through the manuals and stuff, I unconsciously became programmed because uh, what I would do is, because there was so much of it, it literally took us months to sell this stuff because essentially you got to go through it, you got to identify it, you got to do an internet search to figure out what you can sell it for, so on and so forth. And every day I would go through it and he had these leather bound manuals, which went for a lot of money. Went for a crazy amount of money. Leather bound manual, about a hundred pages, thousand bucks, 1500. There were bidding wars for this stuff because you just can't find this stuff. I, I will tell you something that I, that I got. I got one of the reference manuals of Omega Sci-Fi out of a storage unit. And an Omega actually bought on eBay and it, it was a bidding war because there was a bunch of people who were not Omegas who wanted it. Plus an Omega actually got it and he paid $5.50 for this reference manual. I say that to say that when you come across this esoteric, you can't find this anywhere else, people will pay big money. I would say off the top of my head, we probably made $80,000 off of that storage unit with the bulk of it coming from the pictures, the manuals and the instruction things. But literally I would read the manual every day, just turn pages, read it, read it. And I feel, now I'm about to get a little strange here, about to get a little strange here. I feel that the spirit of this old school Dom program me because I would be reading this stuff and then I'll get a little creepy here and the, the temperature in the room would change and he was there. He was there and he was programming me because he saw something in me. And once again, this is pure speculation because if I had to prove it in the court of law, I couldn't, but there was a lot of strange stuff that went on with the storage unit. And I feel that he programmed me and I feel he gave me a gift. And the gift is, because you know, on Disruptive Mail, I be talking about a lot of stuff and I have a sixth sense, if you will, of picking submissive women. I automatically know if the woman is submissive. You know, I've had a few women that I've engaged with and they completely were not submissive and I got rid of them really quickly. But I feel that he opened up my third eye, so to speak, because all of the women that have been in my life since I bought that storage unit have been submissive and most of them like to be spanked. I don't think that that is a, um, coincidence. Once again, programming. So I feel that I was subconsciously programmed by this material and it literally changed my life. 
And one of the things that you have to understand, going back to the Tinder swindler, this guy was programming women. He had an esoteric curriculum where he was programming women, fucking women very quickly. If you would know this, the were like, you know, like they pretty much had sex their second date. And one of the things that you have to understand, and let's have this conversation. When you learn these things, you are in possession of an amazing power. And you have to be responsible. You have to be responsible because I have never, ever abused my power. Thought about it. Thought about it many, many times. But I've never, ever abused my powers or used my special skills for evil or to wound or to hurt someone. I never did that. And then I feel, once again, I don't believe in karma, but I do believe in reaping and sowing. And what you put out in life comes back to you. I don't think that's karma. I think that is, you know, like when you pour water in the glass, the glass fills up. It is a physical, immutable law of nature. And I have been putting out for the last 25 years, 99% good, 99% good. I'm human. I've had a few haters that I went after real hard. I had a few people and I've learned my lesson. I like haters and um, serious dejectors. I, I just leave them where they are. But I feel that once you're in possession, it's a, it's a power, it's a skill set that you can learn. But the thing is, you have got to be open to learning this because, like I said, I watched the Tinder swindler with a totally different mindset and perspective because I knew how he did. I didn't go, he's an evil man, conning these women. I, I, I didn't do that. I looked at, number one, how did he do that? That's what I looked at. It's like, how did he do it? And the number thing he used was dominance. He wasn't a dom. Don't think he spanked any of these chicks, but he used a form of dominance to open up the door because I'll tell you a little story. This was a Craigslist deal. And this was a little later. This wasn't the early days of Craigslist because by the time I met this chick, I had my whole schematic down. And what she saw was a little bit of wealth. Like, if you ask any of these checks, they could not tell you how much money because I never actually talked money. But she saw wealth. And wealth is a form of dominance. And because of the presentation that I put out, she got addicted to me in literally three days, three days. And I'm gonna tell you what I did. First thing I did, she answered the Craigslist ad. And once again, this will be in Glendon's Voodoo. I had a series of things that she had to do. And once again, it was a checklist. You don't do this, you do this, you do this, you do this. Before I met her, before we even talked on the phone, she didn't even know what my voice sounded like. And if they would do, a, B, C, D, E, then I was assured that when then they were before me, they would perform as I wanted them to do so. And this without, without fail happened every time. And I met this girl and she came over and we did what we did. And one of the things that I used to do, which will crack y'all up, is I used to make them strip butt naked right at the front door. Often with the door open, 
just like, get out those clothes. And then uh, I knew their shoe size because uh, that was part of the question there. And I would have them put on the high heels and walk and get, go into the living room and get on their knees, put their chin to their chest, hands behind their back. And then I would sit there and I would grill the shit out of them. I want you to think, why did I do that? When you're naked, you're, you feel very, very vulnerable, extremely vulnerable. This wasn't just to do it. It was an intentional step to make them feel very vulnerable. And a lot of times I would crank down the air conditioning if it was the summer and I get it real cold in the room so they would get chill bumps. And in the winter, I would turn down the heat so it would be cold because I wanted them to feel the sensation because that was part of the tactic. And then I would have this woman crawl on her hands and knees like a dog. And I was like, take my dick out. And they would take it out, put it in your mouth. And they would be on their hands and knees, butt naked in the heels with my dick in their mouth. A completely submissive, from a mind standpoint, completely and utterly submissive position you're on your knees. My dick is in your mouth. You cannot help but feel less than. And very turned on. Very turned on. Because often I would reach behind and stick my fingers in there and they would be dripping. Because this was part of the program. This was part of the program. Each step was deliberate. Every part of the sequence had an important reference to it. And when I talk about this stuff, and this is why I love, love you know, Alan Roger Curry, because he understands a lot of this stuff where average man, I'm, I might as well be speaking Chinese. I might as well be speaking Chinese arithmetic because they're like, what, what, what? Because first of all, you're looking at, why is he doing this to these women? Just kind of like what you would look at, like with the tender swindler, why did he do that versus how did he do that? One of the things is, I mean, this may sound cold and crass, but in this world, we're all big boys and big girls. And if these women were foolish enough to give him all that money, in my opinion, that is on them. Uh, I'm not. I don't think this guy is evil. I don't denounce him. He learned a special skill set that got him millions of dollars. That's what I look at. Once again, I'm not passing judgment on this dude. And this guy went to jail for 15 months, got out, and then he, he figured out something else. He's got a girlfriend because he has these programming skill sets. See, those are his for the rest of his life. And he knows how to meet a woman, seduce a woman, and get her to do whatever he wants her to do. An extremely valuable skill set in today's world where we have men who are literally afraid to speak to women, are literally afraid to go up and introduce themselves to a woman, they can't do it. So what I'm gonna do, and this is gonna be over at the disruptive male side, this will not be general admission because uh, there's only certain people, but if you go ahead and buy the masculine frame, I'm going to start dropping this content really, really soon and you will get disruptive male because disruptive male has so many dirty, nasty things that my payment processor won't support it, so I cannot sell anything off that site, so, but I can sell it off the masculine frame because there's the masculine frame is a more benign set of principles and stuff, and I, I'm going to start working on that because I feel what's going to happen is April because uh, March, this is my warm-up month. I am warming back up to producing a lot of YouTube content. Because uh, I like today's a YouTube day and 
I'm going to warm up to producing training content. So this is coming. But once again, you have been programmed. You have been institutionalized your whole life and you didn't even know what was going on. You have certain thought processes that you feel are your original native thought processes. They're not. That was dropped in your psyche. You did not come up with that on your own. You were exposed to something and you were programmed. There are very few of us who are free agents who are capable of free and independent thought and analysis because the programming is extremely, extremely strong. And one of the things that's so insidious about the programming is you did not even know it was going on. I didn't understand what was going on until I started meditating. I had no clue what was going on. I was just as cluely and obtuse and ignorant as the rest of you. I had no clue what was going on. I didn't know. But once I started to figure out stuff and found the power, man, man, it, it's a beautiful thing. It is a beautiful thing. So that's all I got for you guys today. And I know some of you are going to love it because this one, this one, because of the angels, I didn't add music. I, I wanted this to be more of a conversation with you guys. So I didn't add music and that was intentionally. And yes, the music will be back. So you can be pissed off, but yeah, we're getting ready to do a lot. A lot of things are getting ready to happen. So this is Glendon Cameron at the Institute of Economic Thought. Let me know your thoughts and opinions. Once again, shout out to the nerd gang, to the nerd tribe. I really appreciate you guys. And I will see you in the next one.